Welcome to Behind the Lava Lava, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the vibrant people and cultures of the Pacific. I'm your host, Michael Tan, and I'm joined today by my co-host Milford and Atimo Mingi. This episode is brought to you by Matai Watches, a luxury time priest brand that embodies the essence of the Pacific Islands. Today, we have a very special guest joining us, Albie Robeck. Albie is a Royal New Zealand Navy sailor who has since become a prominent advocate for mental health and founder of Discipline and Allegiance. Through his program, LB has helped countless individuals build their mental toughness and overcome personal challenges. His message is clear. Mental health is just as important as physical health, and we need to prioritize it in order to live happy and fulfilling lives. So in this episode, we'll hear LB's inspiring story, from his time in the Navy to his current work advocating for mental health. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be inspired by the incredible Albie Robeck on this episode of Behind the Lava Lava. So Albie, I'd like to start off the episode with an icebreaker question. And today's icebreaker is, what is one of your greatest fear? So, We'll go all around the room, and I don't want any answers that are sentimental, like losing a family member or or being lonely or alone. Let's get some real answers. So one of my, my, my fears, I have a fear of dogs. So growing up in American Samoa, the dogs in American Samoa, the stray dogs, they're pretty vicious. You walk on the streets, in your village, or wherever you go, uh, a pack of dogs would come and, and try to attack you. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, I know Atimua Mingi probably experiences this too because he's from America Samoa too, but these dogs are not like the, the dogs that are here in the U.S. Uh, where they're domesticated, right? So, so... I've developed a fear of dogs, uh, especially big dogs. When there's a big dog next to me, I I tend to like try to avoid or, or try to not react. So, so that's one of my fears is fear of, of big dogs. I'm not really worried about the small dogs. All right. So I'm very familiar with uh, stray dogs and uh, (laughs) those straight, straight dogs back home, man, they're, they're wild and they're crazy. And it's funny because, you know, when I used to go to the market in uh, uh, uh in American Samoa, all the homeless folks, the stray dogs, you know, where they walk around. I mean, I'm not saying the homeless folks, as in there's like a lot of homeless folks. I'm just saying just maybe one out of the millions of population, but there's like one homeless guy that walks around and there's all the stray dogs are following there. And then all the, you know, just funny story, you know, just a lot of the the, the folks are, you know, saying hadu or, you know, saying, hey, get away, get away from us. But I understand what you mean by that. Uh, on top of the stray dogs, my my fear is getting bitten by a fruit fly bat. You know, growing up back in America, Samoa, we have tons of fruit fly bats back home. And my my fear was always getting bit by one because I, you know, growing up, I, I used to watch all those vampire movies and stuff like that so i thought hey if i get bit by one i was going to turn into a vampire and uh as suck as that sound you know that's that's how i i felt you know and we had a lot of fruit fly bats you know back home and especially in, in where i'm from our village is in the back of the mountain and there's tons of fruit fly bats over there and it's everywhere so you know for the longest time growing up every time i saw a fruit fly bat i was always I, i'm always tempted to, to pick up a rock and you know, throw it over there and try to scare them away. And, you know, it's, it's it's kind of a common thing that now that I think about it, I'm like, man, I think I, I actually killed one. And, you know, I, I, I thought about it. And I'm like, you know, that's kind of like one of those things where, hey, I should have ate it. You know, there's, there's, you know, fruit fly bats kind of like one of those luxury type items, you know, for a lot of the folks, you know, back home. So, I should have told one of my cousins, hey, man, you guys, uh, I killed a bat over there. You guys should go eat it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, that's those are, that was one of my fears growing up. Fears. So you don't want anything sentimental, but 
that's where my real fears lie. I mean, there's a bunch of things though that uh, I would think suck that I would hate. And I think about like, man, I would just hate to get got by some some type of wildlife, like you know, a, a bunch of coyotes or a freaking mountain lion, and I'm not carrying, exercising my Second Amendment. You know what I'm saying? And I'll just be out at the car, then I look around, and then boom, it's mountain by. I'm like, oh, I got got, you know, by family. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like other than some type of freaky situation like that, yeah, most of my actual fears are sentimental. This um, this might sound like a little bit, you know, backwards, but like um, oh, oh, my fear is actually drowning. Um, and it's really like, it stopped me from, like, I mean, you know, like I, I passed my swim tests and everything in the Navy, but, uh, every time like it, you know, like it, my heart was just, you know, pounding. I was a little bit scared about like trying to fail or, you know, like not, not, um, passing and failing. Um, but every time that I jump in that o open water or ocean, eh, it's just, I'm the same, like, you know, you know, you know, getting eaten by shark, a shark or whatnot, or even drowning is like the the main thing so yeah it's just you know every time i jump in even a closed pool it's the same thing and i've been swimming lately too and just trying to trying to slowly edge out that fear of drowning or you know or, or open water swimming so yeah a little bit backwards being in the navy but hey on it not in it yeah thank you for sharing guys um so alby could you tell us about yourself um where you grew up your parents and some of the things that, um, what's your current position and job right now? Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm from, you know, like, a, um, probably the main, actually the main city in New Zealand, I would say, which is Auckland. Um, my dad is Samoan, um, and Norwegian and my mum is full new Wayne. So like, a, you know, like, a, I, I take after both sides really growing up, I was more attached to the new Wayne side, you know, and, and delved into some, some parts of the Samoan side, but. Lately, it's been, you know, pretty 50-50 uh, for the past 20 years or so. So it's been good to, you know, be close to and remain close to both sides. I joined the Navy when I was 18. I'm still in there now. So I just come on 20 years of service. And my current title, you know, position in the Navy is um, is at junior officer training school. So the petty officer there, um, you know, all the, all the junior officers or new officers that join the Defense Force come through our system. And yeah, we just train them over 23 or 21 week program. And like you mentioned on the side, like my vehicle for mental illness and, um, and changing my life as well as trying to have the impact on others, especially in my children's life is, um, through boxing. And I try and amalgamate the way that I train, um, and the way that, the way that I coach, um, amalgamate, you know, the defense force mechanism into it. Um, how it, you know, how, how kind of like need to break someone down to build someone back up install the confidence through um through other areas because i believe that you know like unless you've been through that system of like basic training and promotional training and ex everything else like that you won't be able to to theoretically coach or understand or understand how to push people to that limit and and grow people you know safely as you as you'd say you know so i'm sure ati here will have some uh, questions related to the Navy since he's been in the, in the U.S. Navy. But when I heard that you were in the uh, Royal New Zealand Navy, I was like, oof, that is something that us, the U.S. Uh, military here, we don't know anything about about you guys on that side of the world. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, how was your experience? Uh, could you recall back to, to going in ba basic training? How was that? experience for you um pretty nerve-wracking as as you would be you know like a, a young 18 year old just you know going into technically a foreign foreign environment um i'm just so lucky that like um i started working at a very young age and so i understood the you know the the concept of working to be able to 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 apply yourself in the right positions to be able to to get yourself further and i also had like i did army army cadets um prior to leaving up to that um but yeah going through basic training like i it's kind of like a love-hate relationship eh? and it's not until you finish 
that basic training or you or you progress through your career that you look back on it and you're like, man, that was such an awesome experience. Um, probably the best experience that you'd ever get in the Defence Force, or from my perspective anyway, um, that offers the most, you know. So I, I loved it. Um, yeah, I just thought it was a really cool experience overall. I made some really good mates and, you know, the instructor or a couple of instructors that took us through, you know, like a, I still touch base with them on a, you know, on a monthly or, or you know, basis. And some of them I trained for boxing for for a couple of fights. So it was good to to reconnect on a on a different level yeah. yeah and in 20 years that's a that's a long time do you do you recall the reason why you decided to join the navy because uh for for, for some some of us it was a a better option the u.s military was a better option for us to join but what was your reason um i was the same too it, it, it ended up it was the better option and it is still today for like you know people that don't really have no option, so to speak. Um, I mean, everything's to a prerequisite is to have, you know, X, Y, and Z. Back then, I didn't have any um, qualifications. We called a school certificate back then. So I had no qualification at all. So when I did pass the, the pre-entry test, I was pretty shocked, you know. So it's, it was the only option that I, I did realistically have. I tried to join the Army. My parents didn't want me to join the Army. They wanted me to go down the na Navy you know, route. So, um, yeah, no regrets. I, 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 I totally loved the decision that they made for me at that time. But like, a, like you said, it's, it was the only option that, that I, that I really had at that point of time. Hey, yeah. So thank you. Uh, like I said, again, thank you for your service. And I know you're still serving. I have so many questions. I never, you know, before our recording, I didn't even look up, uh, you know, the defense and the different ranks, in the Navy on that side of the world. So I guess that's my question. Now, I know in uh, our military here in the United States, we have two subsections. We have the enlisted side and then we have the officer side. So I'm pretty sure you're on the enlisted side, uh, if, if I'm correct. Majority of my time, like you, well, I think you're saying uh, right now you're, you're training uh, junior officers to come in uh, to serve. Uh, and Majority of my time, you know, I was enlisted and uh, was joined was uh, at uh, Officer Kenner School in uh, Quantico, that's in Virginia, uh, to train uh, officer candidates to become Marines. So majority of my time, while I was in the Navy, was attached to a lot of Marine units, uh, especially on the training side, to uh, you know teach these young officers on the medical side portion of because thing about it is that a lot of people don't understand about our <laughs> U.S. Armed Forces is that Department of the Navy <clears throat> consists of the Marine Corps as well. So uh, the Marine Corps, they don't have their, they don't, <laughs> I had to go there, guys. They don't have a, a, a medical department. So they rely heavily on the Navy for all their medical services, i.e. I was part, majority of my job when I was in, so... Uh, I was part of a uh, small group of us at a training command in Quantico uh, teaching um, uh, Marines. Can you touch up on the enlisted side? I know for us, we call uh, ourselves petty officers. What is the terminology on that side of the world? And and I, I have, I have follow-up questions to as well. And have you ever participated in RIMPAC? Uh, RIMPAC is... Uh, a uh, training exercise in, that's you know held with different uh, nations. I know the Royal Marines uh, Tonga. They join uh, and in the southeastern sea. I think Thailand or Vietnam. Vietnam. Uh, there's different nations that get together, and it's held in Hawaii annually. And that's you know you no know, just uh, training on different uh, operations, special operations stuff like that. If if I, I don't even recall, I think I've seen a few naval uh, New Zealand. Uh, so if you could touch up on that, that'll be that'll be great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so um, the enlisted or not, whatever um, you know, the equivalent to your side is non-commissioned officers, and then we have commissioned officers. And I'm a petty officer as well. Um, I, what would you? That's like four from the bottom. And three away from the the top for the non-commissioned officers. Um, 
yeah, so I wouldn't, you know, know what that equates to, to on, you know, on your side, but I, I quite like that position. It, it, it's enough um, authority that you can, you know, like you can establish change and not too much admin. Uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, they really like too much admin. It just gets, you know, over the head cut type thing. But um, Rimpack, to answer your question there, I've never been on Rimpack, but there has been Navy vessels for the past, like, uh, six years, maybe seven years, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that, but being part of Rib Pack. Um, and it is massive, eh? Like, I, I've always wanted to do it, but un unfortunately, like, my sights aren't set on sea time and they haven't been set on going to sea for quite some time. Um, I mean, like, you get to the point in your career where you just want to, you know, work on work on what your strengths and, and you know, at that time it was um, to, to trade change to a different trade. And yeah, we just don't go to sea anymore in, the, in my tree, which is, um, you know, blessing the sky's ready. Like I, I, I quite like to, to give my family everything that I do have at this point of time, but still trying to give the defense force everything that I, that I can possibly offer also. Nice. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I was the same way like you, uh, you mentioned that, um, your parents didn't want you to join the army for me. I, <laughs> Before uh, enlisting in uh, non-commission, uh, same thing with you guys. I was I took four years of uh, Army JROTC in high school, so uh, that four years uh, allowed me when I joined. I joined as an E3, so I, my time in the military kind of progressed through the ranks uh, pretty fast at a lower time limit, you know, compared to someone that didn't that never did JROTC uh, before. So, uh, JRTC, um, uh, four years, um, with the army and I always wanted to join the army, but, uh, so happens that the, uh, recruiters for the Navy came down to American Samoa and they, uh, and they were looking to recruit, uh, for the Navy. And it's interesting because, uh, I, and I joined back in 2008 was that the Navy hadn't recruited in American Samoa for the longest period until 2008. So I was one of the few folks that joined the Navy in 2008, ever since they stopped recruiting in the early nineties. So they just picked back uh, recruiting uh, down in the territory back in 2008. And I don't, I don't know if there still, still are now, but I'm, I was just like you, you know, I was one of those guys that I had thought to myself, you know, work smart, not hard, you know? <laughs> so I figured if I joined the Navy, you know, and I, I would be on the other side, you know, not not carrying a, a weapon. But then eventually I had to I was attached to a lot of the Marine units where, you know, all, all those other stuff came into play. So I, I completely understand uh, what you mean by, you know, what your parents were trying to prevent you from doing. Uh, on that note, what uh, were you what, what was your job, basically? Or did you have to change your your, uh, I guess for, for us, it's called rating or job. So are you still doing the same thing or, you know, I'm pretty sure in your 20 years, you had to change, you know, go lateral from your job. So if you could touch up on that, if you were in the medical field or whatnot, you know? Yeah, cool. Um, so I joined the, I just joined the Navy as a, a sonament. And then, um, along the way they, they amalgamated and they became two branches, which is, um, radar and sonar. And so, um, that was the transition there. And then, um, in 2013, I, oh, sorry, 2016, I trade changed over to, um, what we call a youth development specialist. And so, um, that became a new branch and a unit that was actually, you know, had a history. It was pretty old, um, in terms of how long it's been running and they started to make it a little bit more mainstream. So I jumped over to that. A youth development unit is just basically about taking a, you know, um, at risk youth, um, re offenders, et cetera, et cetera, um, and trying to reintegrate them back in employment. So basically, it's a basic training on steroids for non military people using the military technique to try and drive, you know, um, enforce change and get, just give them those good daily habits and routines and, um, and values, you know. So a trade change that, that's what I, that's where I am at currently in terms of my trade and i just jumped ship over back to denport so youth development unit was at the air force base and now i went back to the navy base and just you know like look to 
just utilize different skills eh, with um, different different folks, so to speak. So going from essentially at-risk youth that really um, had nothing growing up, um, you know, didn't have a stable background, et cetera, et cetera, going to the opposite side where, like, you you know, lack of a better word, um, privileged people, you know, like that, that do have qualifications and do have a good life or come up through, you know, like a, a privileged system, so to speak. So um, trying to find the balance amongst that was pretty hard, but I think we got there in the end. And yeah, it's just good to good to see both worlds actually. So, Albi, could you could you tell us about a particular memorable moment during your time in the Navy that, that has impacted your personal and professional development, or or probably what you currently do right now? Yeah, cool. So, um, professional development uh, that would be um, in two thousand eight, where um, Samoa parts of the Cook Islands and, and parts of Tonga, you know, had that, that tsunami. I was on board Canterbury at that time, which is, oh, um, and, you know, auxiliary craft. And so, yeah, going over there to be able to, to resupply, uh, to help out, et cetera, et cetera, was really, really awesome to do. We did that a couple of times in 2008 and 2009. So to professionally um, develop through that was really great. You know, like I, it, and plus the sense of belonging, right? It's where I'm, where I'm from. And just because I'm, you know, Samoan or New Wayne doesn't mean that, like, I don't connect with people from Tonga or, or from, you know, uh, Cook Islands, like Puka Puka and, and things like that. So it was just good to to do something of purpose and meaning and to give back to our people. Personally, it would have been going through, um, you know, like, like going through depression and, and navigating that space and also trying to be a solo parent and, and maintain a career without ruining a career. Back then when I was going through depression, it was kind of a, you know, the stigma towards it was massive. And to, you know, like to see, you know, like men cry basically was, was taboo. So yeah. So personally that, that was, that was a great development and learning curve and professionally the 2008 um, tsunami was, you know, it was a, it was a great learning tool for me. And, and would you say that the, the Royal the Royal New Zealand Navy has, has basically shaped your views on mental resilience and your overall well being? Yeah, I think um it, it always had, you know. And I think like if you're not aware to aware of what they actually do and, and really scope you through basic training and other you know, even PT, basic PT circuit circuit training um that we do have like it it really does subconsciously build you know your resilience to, to a lot of things not only just exercise so i i do think looking back on it like not being able to to be aware of those skills that they do give you and really really turn them into a positive uh how you say coping mechanism or um to take those learnings and be actively be able to to put them into good use yeah, you know, like uh, if you're not aware of that, you, you you won't be able to use them. So, well, essentially, what I'm trying to say is that yeah, subconsciously you did. Um, I just wish that you know, like back then, I really had the nous of really thinking, you know, uh, forward thinking, basically. So that that's that's what I essentially do now when I do try and train, you know, train off junior officers or at risk youth or even clients on my on my other side of my life is. To, to ensure that they utilize the things that we do put them through and take those key points and and really utilize them uh, moving forward, you know, when they do have something, you know, of hardship, whatever it may be. Just real quick, uh, let's compare uh, the physical requirements for the, uh, the PT, the test, between the Royal New Zealand Navy and Ati, the U.S. Navy. So, what's your uh, yearly requirement to, to pass a physical test in the Navy? I'll, I'll start off with this. So, it just, I think we got in the way with, well, I think the age, uh, age, there's age, different age groups. Uh, so, when I was going in, a little young 18 year old, uh, we had to pass a mile and a half run. And for my age group, I had to run a mile and a half within 12 uh, minutes and 15, uh, or 12 minutes and 15 seconds. And then on top of that, we had the push-ups and we had the sit-ups. 
Uh, so we would do uh, sit-ups first for I think two minutes, and then same thing with uh, push-ups, and then the mile uh, and a half run was afterwards. And then attached to the marine units, I had to do the same thing, but it was then a three mile run. And uh, I, well, I think you guys are familiar with that. I know it's three mile run. Uh, we had to do the pull ups and push ups and sit ups. Like, what was the minimum uh, passing for us? Uh, for for, for Navy chips and guys, for us Navy guys to attach to the, the, you guys, we, for our age group, I had to come in at least 16 or 17 minutes. And I got in like around usually six, 15 minutes. Man, that's when I was fit back in the day, running two, three miles. And uh, 15, I was like, that's like a cross country runner right there. I actually, no, I blame my lines. It's 20 minutes for us, for Navy guys, 20 minutes. So I was, <laughs> I had to track my step, you know. So, <laughs> oh, dude. So, yeah, so for us, uh, for day before, I'm yeah, so I'm on running 15, 17 minute, three mile. <laughs> Show me that. I'm Show like, me that. <laughs> hold on, man. Let me, let me check that. So, yeah, the three mile run, we had to come in at 20 minutes. And then I, uh, well, I think 25 was the buffer, but for us, our age group was, was, uh, uh 20 minutes, uh, 18 coming in. And then, um, cause there's, there's a little, uh, requirements for us to, actually maintain to be in Marine units, you had to maintain a certain level because we want to be competitive for some reason. I don't know why our Navy PT wasn't enough. So, but for Naval side, 12 minutes and 15 seconds for the mile and a half run, you had to do push-ups um, as much as you can for a minute. And then same thing with uh, sit-ups. Uh, not sure if that's the same with our counterpart. What was the, the, the cutoff number for push-ups and sit-ups uh, I think our minimum was 40 I think for uh for for sit-ups it was it was pretty low if I, if I recall correctly it was pretty low it wasn't it wasn't like some extravagant number like I, I think for because there's we have you know one set for females and one set for males I think it was 20 and 10 for Females, I believe, one of those numbers. Uh, and I know for males, it's either 20 or 25. Because they change it throughout the, when I was in. And majority of my time was, like I said, I was attached to Marine units, so I had to do that. Do that. But that's, that's what it was. Unless you have the numbers there with you, you can let me know. But uh, those, were, those were our PT requirements. A mile and a half run, a minute sit-ups, minute push-ups. Max them out, and you know you'd be good to go. Yeah, when I when I joined, uh, they were making the transition from a two mile peg. Um, so that two mile peg is actually a two mile run. I don't remember. I don't recall the 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 time to get it. I think maybe a G one, which was the highest grading, uh, was under. I would say, I think it was like thirty minutes or even twelve minutes. I'm not too sure. Um, and then I don't remember the, the press ups and the sit up requirement. And then they quickly transferred across to, um, the beak test. And so the beak test at that point in time was, a, well, nothing was scaled. You had to pass uh, 7.1, 10 press ups and, and that was it. But now they've, um, changed the fitness test to make sure, uh, to age and, you know, um, sex specific for my age. I'm not too sure. I just run it. To where I max out, and and you know, like trying to ensure that I only do it once a year rather than twice a year. So <laughs> as long as I pass, I'm I'm all good. I remember uh, vividly. I think it was back in 2012. We were because usually as the officer candidates that um, anything the Marine wanted to do as far as weapons, uh, it was at TBS and at OCS. They were trying out new. Uh, the PFT, the new PFT that you guys are going through now, it was we were actually testing our uh, the officer candidates uh, with the new PFTs, and it was back in 2012. And it's interesting because the Army now has changed their they call it AC, the ACFT now. Uh, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because my uh, wife is in the military and uh, she's currently serving. Uh, they are transitioning to what the Marines are doing now. You know, firemen carry, uh, you know, ammo box carry. 
I, I thought I initially thought the army was doing it for a while, but apparently not. You know, now they're the army's transitioning over to going the eight the PFT for you know the Marines and Marines. So that's that's pretty interesting. So Albi, um, could you speak on what inspired you to start discipline and allegiance and and what made you start this program and how it's helped people overcome their their personal challenges yes yeah, so um i've been i've been boxing for quite some time i was training for um a while before i decided to fight and um i was stationed in melbourne australia for a year and a you know three quarters to two years or something like that touch and go and then I decided to fight while I was over there in amateur boxing. And then I came back over to New Zealand um, and I and I continued boxing from there. And they got to a point where I couldn't box anymore just because of injuries and stuff like that. So I took up the whole coaching aspect and, um, you know, and then, and then found like, uh, to me, boxing really saved my life. And not only physically, but also the mentally um, and emotional part aspect really nourish that you know so discipline and allegiance really like was a rebirth of what i had going on at, at that point in time which was called fortress and basically fortress uh, was tailored around like boot camps so to speak um our fitness boot camps and i i was just utilizing our navy techniques like equipment carries um circuit circuits with re reali realistically um no end point uh, method to madness type thing so applying that that got on um, pretty huge on a, on a huge scale and I was right across Auckland at that time and my partner at that time um, we split ways and she took fortress and I developed discipline legions and so discipline legions now is basically so, uh, just a really a brand that that drives the mental aspect of life and a byproduct of that is the physical aspect and the emotional aspect. So, yeah, up until now, we're going really good. We don't really have, I don't run it as a program, so to speak. I just use boxing as that vehicle. And then also I just use, um, you know, the challenges that I do do as a as a vehicle for change as well. Yeah, and I, I know this has a, a backstory. Uh, are you able to sh uh, share with us that mental health? story and and what you went through that made you decide to start this yeah totally so um you know like i said you know a while back was about i just you know went through and navigated depression on on multiple occasions through the defense force for whatever reasons right and i just thought and and like i said boxing was the vehicle for change and helped me you know find some middle ground and 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 change my life so um I guess, you know, like, like using a, a negative situation, trying to turn it into a positive situation to create as much impact as I can, you know, because in New Zealand, like one of four, four to five people that are affected by some type of mental illness, the suicide rates are high. Uh, mental illness and suicide rates are, are really, really prominent and high amongst our people, you know? And so like, I thought, how can I utilize my experience, utilize what I know, my knowledge that that I've gained through the defense force and also through through the pathways that I've that I've um, you know navigated, and be able to like make an impact and make a dent in those statistics where I can drive our you know our Maori and Pacifica youth suicide rates and mental rate you know um, mental illness rates down a little bit and also just create some change you know so that's that's basically how everything's come about to now and and then on the other end of that is really trying to give my my kids something to aspire to you know like there's no doubt in my mind that somewhere along their lifetime that they're going to experience some type of mental barrier or you know it's a mental issue if the, if if that's a, a right word so trying to give them the best platform so to speak to to navigate that space safely i know we're not experts here do you think mental health is something that is acquired that we acquire it uh during our lifetime or is it something that's hereditary 
i.e. being that, um, you know, from an unstable home, stuff that had to do with the socioeconomic status of that family, uh, situation with the environment, you know, the kids were born in. Uh, I, I find it that a majority of mental health issues stems from a child's, you know, their environment where they were born in. And I know everybody has their different paths of acquiring it, but do you feel during your time with uh, the troubled you know, teens that some of their issues had spent from, you know, their their background in, in the home? Uh, is it, or is it a, I would say, is it on average or is it something, what, 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 what is a pinpoint, you know, what, for the issues, you know, and I know we develop different traumas that affect us psychologically through, you know, just the way that we were brought up in the homes. Is that something, like I said, is it something that's, we already have hereditary traits of it that when we grow up, it, it's triggering and then we have these issues or is it something that we acquire? You know, it might make sense or... Can you uh, touch up on that? Um, yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I, I wouldn't really, I really wouldn't really know, you know, like um, I, I only can speak from my experience and my experience was um, one, the environment. The other thing was like lack of, oh, the other thing was just mistakes as well, you know, like not learning from mistakes and getting myself in, into a situation that I was really ashamed of and didn't really know how to mentally cope. Yeah. And that, and that was just like, basically the the turning like you know like the part that actually got me down you know that that low in life um on on those those couple occasions so not learning from mistakes of me the environment obviously that plays a huge part um the stuff that we've like that i've experienced in in the youth sector is the environment and the lack of knowledge to be able to to deal with um emotions deal with certain situations Anger is huge. Like that, that was my prominent emotion growing up. You know, up until like I was, you know, early thirties, was that that was my go-to. And anger, you know, like trying to deal with anger and how to how to really harness that and turn it into to something better um, takes a long time. So for me, that was that was one of the issues as well. Okay, so, you know, with the process, you know, during while you were working with the troubled teens, so they graduate or they finish the program. Is there, do you guys do a, a support process or does that, the, or does the government or private entities, do they follow up with the children or, or is this something that's part of the program where if you're done, hey, good luck to you, may the best, you know, take care, sayonara, is that something? How does the, the program, you know, exist after? Does it follow the children or is this, how does it pass along? They just graduate and then that's it? Yeah, so they, they do a six-week program. They graduate after us. Um, they do have a beginning phase where they come from uh, the Ministry of Social Development, um, which basically is like our benefit, um, that you know, our system. And we they come with us, they live in, pro, stay in program, for six weeks and when they do graduate you know they they oh I, I would i would hate to put a statistic on it but i probably would say about like 98 percent of them do graduate with like employment or um or further education opportunities so like it, it's a high number and then from part uh, past that date is that um you know msd the ministry of social development follow up with them so from that six week point uh sorry after that six week point essentially that they're, they're, they're theirs you know so we have nothing nothing to follow up on them uh, but like i said like auckland's such a small place realistically that you know you you do see them around and you know you can't help but really just touch base with them and ask them how they're doing you know like you know how, how their life's turned around and nine times eight times out of ten it's they, they're doing really really great i know the reason why i had to ask that was because I don't know if uh, it's still going on in Western Samoa, but I know Western Samoa used to be a hotspot for where, you know, the troubled kids, they get sent over there to Western Samoa 
and they call them boot camps and it was crazy i think in the 90s the way uh and just thinking back on what i remember is that the way the children were treated they were they were strict the styles that were thought were far saw more you know hard labor and stuff like that but uh, at the end they came out you know good you know in that sense and i don't know why it got shut down i, I don't know maybe it was illegal but you know, something like that you know i know in in our parts of the world in back in america Samoa, the village does a whole lot to uh control and you know as a big family unit you know starts with the family small household and then it stands out to the whole bigger community in the village and you know the ties and everything ties into the culture so that's kind of like how and I'm, I'm thinking because right now the rates for suicide in america Samoa has skyrocketed and it was due because of covid well i want to say it's because of covid and but it's covid uh, attributes to the statistics the increase in suicide um but it's just sad to to hear that going on back home from where uh we're from um it's just interesting that you know when I was growing up, uh, nothing, I mean, you could hear maybe one or two suicide, but uh, just hearing the news on that is, is you know, horrible and uh, sad for the families. Uh, but that's the reason why I kind of, you know, touched up on that because as much as we like to, to feel there's like a one for all to, you know, as far as a fix it for all, uh, you know, every situation is different, you know, for each individual. And uh, I think it really stems down to, like, you know, the family unit. Uh, you know, that typical mom and dad. If that, that foundation is, is strong, I, I think, uh, you know, I may be wrong, but it'll, it'll be beneficial overall. So, Albie, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard this in the U.S., but... Um, I don't know if it's true, too, because there's also a lot of theories going around here. But the the Veterans uh, Administration reports that t about 22 veterans here in the U.S. succumb to suicide a day. So that's how they, they come up with what's called 22 a day movement, where people do um, 22 actions like 22 miles 22 push-ups 22 whatever exercise to try to support and dispel um suicide you know but but i want to i want to learn about your side uh in new zealand uh, what are some common misconceptions about mental health um that are on your side of the world um because I, I i i hear about our side but i want to learn about What's in New Zealand? Some common misconception about depression, anxiety, and all that mental health problems. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, like in, in the past, and um, I, I think it, it was like it was real, I want to say real bad, but, you know, the, the stigma around mental illness just wasn't healthy. Um, and it affected quite a lot of people. It affected like males in particular about opening up um seeking help and actually talking about it i i do believe that um that we've come a long way you know in this side of the world for us um come a long way and actually you know one dealing with it two talking out openly um three being vulnerable and just like a, like seeing more males step up into that that role of like highlighting things and really breaking down the stigma that Man, men do cry, men do struggle, and it's okay for them to actually ask for help now and again. I mean that like there's still a way to go on that that part of it, but but in terms of of you know the timeline base of where I became conscious of it to where it is now um ha is a massive change, and yeah i like grateful for a lot of people that have done that that type of work, but yeah anything to do with like any like uh veterans and things like that i'm not too sure about on our side 
but PTSD is huge. And, you know, like not many people do actually talk about PTSD as much as they do talk about depression, so to speak, but, um, you know, per se, but I mean, PTSD is quite huge from what I, I think and what I understand and, you know, the first responders, um, environment. So fire service, mainly police and ambulance as well. As a fellow, well, I got to assume you're a boxing fan since you do boxing. So I got to ask Ryan Garcia versus Tank Davis. Who do you got? Man, I'm, I'm a Tank fan. Eh? I love Tank. Uh, that doesn't go to say that um, Garcia won't, you know, I won't is not counted out. Like, I, I do think he's strong. I do think he's fast. And I, I don't think that, you know, they should underestimate them, which I don't think they are. But, man, I love Tank. Tank's like, he's dynamic, yes. He's like a mini Tyson, eh? What about you? Yeah, yeah same. Uh, Tank just finds a way. Like, he adapts to his opponents so well. Like, he finds those openings and he exposes it. I, I mean, unless Ryan finds some way to, I think, utilize his length and speed, I, I think Tank will adapt and, you know, find it. Find a chance. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think that um, the tank has more more IQ than what people give him credit for, right? So, with what you're doing with discipline and allegiance, uh, it reminds me of I don't know if you ever heard of out here in America, the cave of Adullam by this man named Jason Wilson. You, you yeah, ever heard no, of I haven't heard. Uh, what, what's it called? The cave of Ad- right. Adullam. A D U L L A M. Well, so he comes out of Detroit, Michigan, you know, pretty rough area. And um, he uses martial arts to, you know, teach many things, but, you know, he also works on mental health and aspect, the, me- the mental health aspect and just becoming a better person. There's like many lessons, you know, aside from the martial arts, it's, you just got to check them out. But it, it reminds me, or what you're doing reminds me a lot of that. And, and that's amazing, you know, except you're using boxing as opposed to the martial arts form that Jason uses. But uh, what you're doing, not, you know, it's for, for all ages, I think, which is amazing. But focusing on our youth, you know, a lot of people, it's so easy to criticize what the, what the young folks are doing wrong nowadays and whatnot. So easy to just, you know, down on them. But at the same time, you know, it's like, it's, it's the older folks. It's our generation, you know, who's kind of letting them down by not teaching them awareness, uh, you know, self-awareness of what they're able to overcome and all that. And I think uh, what you're doing definitely amplifies that you know helps them know because that that's one big thing in this age of information you know there's there's a lack of self-awareness in one's own abilities and, and capabilities so many people you know have these ideas of trying to help somebody but they don't take action but you are and all it takes is one and it's great to see you being that one you know in this in this arena uh, which I think will branch out, you know, only make the world better. So, it, man, I hey, love what you're doing and uh, hope to continue to follow your journey. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I, I really do, eh? you know, and uh, I like, I I'm want to like quickly acknowledge that, you know, like it, although the work that I'm doing is, 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 you know, somewhat making a difference. There's other people that are out there that are doing a lot, a lot better the, uh, job than I am, and um, I'm just grateful to be in in the same discussion as they are. Um, yeah, and I, I, man, I I just love it. Like I, I really want to see a change in particular amongst our people um, to get those statistics down as low as we can, but just to see, um, you know, see them thrive in life um, and just be happy, so to speak. So, yeah, like I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's it's a. Uh... It's a great legacy that you're creating for yourself and will pass on to hopefully you said you mentioned for your for your kids. And um I'm just curious about what Nick mentioned about your Guinness Guinness World Record 
uh, punching bag. Could you could you tell us about that? Because I'm I'm very curious what it, it is. I haven't looked it up yet. Yeah, so um, it's not it's not actually officiated like uh, like um, it's not official for whatever reasons. But I did like you know like whether they officiated or not. Like I'm in that uh, in that mindset that I that I bet it. Like I I smashed it out of the water and I went over and uh, I went over and above to to make sure that I did that. Um, the Guinness World Record. It's named the longest punchback marathon. And basically, the guy that said it, he was from Canada, and he did it in remembrance for his wife. And he said it at, like, I think it was 54 hours or something like that, 54 hours, 50 minutes maybe. And basically, they, the the requirements is to um, punch the bag one punch every minute. Ah, uh, Sorry, one punch every second for as long as you can. Every 60 minutes that you do do, you accumulate a five-minute break, and it, whether you take that then or you um, or you you bank that, that's certainly up to you. So whatever's in your game plan, you'll be able to do that. So if let's say you do five hours straight, you get twenty-five minutes um, to rest. And so essentially, that got broken a couple of times from uh, you know some other people. And I thought, look, I'm going to smack this out at sixty hours. I'm going to try and establish change. Um, you utilize boxing as that platform to do that um, and just also get back to myself. So, and then my, my, my son, he was heavily into the Guinness World Records at that time. So basically, like, um, I thought what better way to do this than to do it on my birthday, and, you know, and, and make it work that way. So at nine o'clock on my birthday, I don't even know how old I was actually at that, that point of time. 35 maybe, I think, 34. And yeah, I thought that I'll give, give back to myself and also give back to other people. And so I boxed for 60 hours. Um, I had a game plan that went well for the first like 12 to 16 hours. And then it was just touch and go from there. So yeah, that, that's basically it. And I fin- I started at nine in the morning and I finished at nine at night on, we- on Wednesday. So it was good. Yeah, it, definitely a highlight reel for myself. Uh, you know, uh, it's been an honor uh, having the honor and the privilege having uh, to uh, interview, brother. Uh, I know you're still in. You're doing your time. You know, uh, what can I say? You know, uh, a service to country, service to the common man. You know, it's always important in every day that we do. I uh, really appreciate that I got an opportunity to interview you. I thank you for what you do. You know, I know uh, Milford, you know, got the tail end of what Milford was saying. Uh, but anything that you do to get back to the community is is very good, uh, very well thought of. And, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, we got all got to strive to do every day to get back to our communities, you know, not only locally, but uh, on a bigger, uh, larger stage as what you're doing. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. So appreciate that. So, uh, Albi, what's what's next for you and for the program, uh, Discipline and Allegiance? Uh, how can our listeners get involved and help support your work? Yeah, cool. So, ever since 2019, when I did that Guinness World Record, I had a habit of, like, establishing challenges along the way, um, and I've done quite a few. Uh, one one prominent thing that I've done is um, every every year we hold um, we hold a burpee event. And the burpee event, the fitness army fitness test is 2.4 kilometers run. And we do 2.4 kilometers of burpees. Um, I have a habit of like doing 2.4 kilometers of burpees myself. Um, so that's a burpee, chest the ground, two steps forward, so on and so forth. And just accumulate distance over that. And then like I, um, the event, there's a group of four people collectively do that around the 400 meter track. And they just keep going to so 2.4. So it's, We've made some inroads to that, and that that's one of the ones that are, that will be coming up this year again. Um, we had a we had um, cy- a cyclone recently with some floods in New Zealand, and I'm looking at um, actually trying to kick twelve hours of burpees off as soon as I can in order to raise funds to help out, um, you know, in the hardest hit um, areas. But one of the prominent things that are coming very shortly in July is that we've got this beach. Um, on the west coast of New Zealand, which is called Mirawai Beach. Um, and I'm running to it where myself and a, a young guy that I mentor and who's a close friend of mine, we're running this together. So um, it equates uh, there and back 
147 kilometers of running on on black sand. So um, that they'll be up real shortly. And then I have another a challenge underneath my belt, which is I need to kickstart the training for, which is that swimming thing, uh, you know, like trying to kick my fear to the curve, but swim as far as I can with another guy that I know for 24 hours. So, um, yeah, those are the two things that, or three things basically that are coming up in the next couple of months. And then, um, maybe I'm running, running one again. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm trying to actually get to New Air Island for hands act day to, to run a run around New Air Island. Um, you know, in, in our military rig and a weight vest, um, to do that. So yeah, hopefully that goes ahead. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'll be here in on behind the lava lava. We'd like to, to ask our guests, do you have any questions for us? Because here on a podcast, we like to learn and find ways to make our podcast better. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I um I do like a like I wanna like you know if I can ask a question to all three of you, it's like you know what's one one takeaway from your career that that's helped you transition if you guys are still in or transition through life, um and then the other thing is like I strongly um, believe that you know what gets me through each day is my purpose and my why. So if you like to share, um you don't have to obviously, but if you can share what your purpose or your why is. Um, I'd, I'd love to know that. So um, it took me a while uh, to find my purpose and my why. And, and one of the reasons why I'm still hustling and trying to better myself now is because of this podcast. Uh, yes, I, yes, I have my wife and my kids, but that's on a different, um, that's on a different level. That's on a different uh, category, but, this podcast has helped me improve my mental health instead of going regularly every week to go see my my usual therapist. Uh, because I have a story of depression and attempting suicide um, a few times. So this podcast has helped me immerse myself here in the Utah community and and try to tell people's stories before I was just saying, Oh, tell people story, tell, tell people stories. But, but now I realize how important it is because we had a, a cast member. His name is Fisa White Thompson who passed away from leukemia last year. And that made me thinking, made me think that, you know, what we do is important. Uh, people may not see it, but, the people that we bring on here and have them tell their stories, their legacy stays with us. They're, they're part of us. And hopefully the listeners can learn from them and be an inspiration to their lives. So those are my thoughts. Uh, it, I'm, I'm a, a regular electronics mechanic on a, on a air force base right now, but for so long I had no, goals no reason to to do things but with this high with with this side hobby of a podcast i I found something that'll that'll keep me going yes we have like our our obligations to our jobs to our families but i think this is just one of the highlights of my life is forming this podcast to to highlight other people and just to talk about my problems here (laughs) With with my 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 good friends, so those are my thoughts. So, my majority of my life has always been servitude, uh, servitude in the way of helping people, uh, helping family. Well, as a young young guy growing up in American Samoa, I left at a very young age to uh, go to California, uh, help out my. Uh, auntie and uh, taking care of my grandpa and uh, my grandpa uh, in our hospital during that time in American Samoa uh, had the connotation that if any if you were to go to that hospital with any dire issue or dire uh, situation you were guaranteed that you were going to die so my uh, dad 
and his siblings, they decided that they wanted to take their uh, dad off island uh, for better medical services. And so uh, their agreement was one of them, you know, had a representative in taking care of their, their father, my grandpa. So uh, I went on behalf of my dad, uh, tagged along with my auntie. And for five years, that was my commitment was to taking care of my grandpa. And I mean, taking care of him, I mean, bedside, bath, changing uh, his diaper when he couldn't um, I'd go to the bathroom. Um, and, you know, so it got to the point where I was performing uh, the nurse services, you know, at such a young age. Uh, so when I joined the military, I already had that kind of mindset. So my job in the military was, uh, you know, I was a corpsman and corpsman in the Navy uh, kind of not early means, you know, you're pretty much in the medical field, so to speak. So for the longest time, and that's what majority of my job was in the military and transitioning now, my purpose now to me and my, and I've, I've always felt this when I was young is the, to be in the medical field. And that's something that, uh, that I'm striving to try to do right now. Um, and I don't, I would say that I don't like to, um, if, if being in the medical field means the highest level you could go is to become a doctor, that's what I'm going to strive, strive to do is to become, if I can't do that, then I know there's other levels in the medical field that I can, you know, serve in, you know, I was, a. Uh, I got, when I got out initially, I, uh, I was, uh, working at a private company in Hawaii for a uh, laboratory. So I was a phlebotomist, but I wasn't, uh, I was an advanced phlebotomy and it felt, it felt that I was doing my part in helping out, but I felt that I was limited, you know, there, was, there wasn't really no growth because I had maxed out as far as my uh, uh, specialty to take me. So it's something that I'm striving still to do now is try to, you know, get to that highest level in the medical field here in the United States, uh, which is to become a doctor. Uh, ideally, uh, my profession that I want to go in specializing is in uh, nephrology and nephrology is kidneys, do kidneys. And the reason why is because of our Polynesian, you know, uh, you know, situation, you know, we have the highest rates of hypertension, highest rates of heart attack, highest rates of, you know, mortality rates as far as, you know, uh, those, uh, those type of, uh, diseases, you know, hypertension, kidney disease, kidney failure. So that's something that I wanted to get into. So, to, uh, I ideally be in a research mindset so that's something that that's my purpose and my why as of right now uh, i'm working towards that slowly uh, i have to do a test to get into school and that's the uh the route that i'm in now uh, ideally at the the end goal is of course working you know in the pacific uh, ideally i would want to go back home work in american samoa I'm currently right now, I'm in Texas. And the reason why I'm in Texas is because my wife is in the military and we're stationed here in Texas. But ideally, uh, at the end of the day, I would love to go back and work at the local hospital back in American Samoa, or I could open up my own clinic. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of ideas, but that's kind of my big picture goal that I want to do. Uh, so that's uh, something that I'm fighting for right now. And I appreciate the question, brother. Thank you. Military experience, it, it reaffirmed or it solidified what was already, you know, being still uh, growing up in the Samoan household. I mean, even though I wasn't the best to exemplify it growing up, you know, being the dummy that I was, but uh, being in the military, what I took away was just being able to be comfortable being uncomfortable, that things and to go on top of that, that things aren't always as bad as they seem. Like there's that adapt and overcome. Like I, I mean, it, as true as that thing is, I I get tired of hearing that. But 
I mean, it, it's real. Like you face a problem, don't dwell on it. There's a solution somewhere. You know, keep looking, keep digging. Oh, uh, and as for my why, uh, I'm it seems a bit selfish, but I think just uh, just for me to be happy and and for me to be happy, uh, I think it's just uh, making being able to make memories with my family and make being able to keep my kids happy to ask them, Hey, are you happy? Are you okay? And they say, yes. Uh, but I, I'm not doing great at it. <laughs> I got, I got a lot of work to do on that end, but that that's what I want to strive for to, is to know that they're happy. Same time, a little bit of what you do are just, um, seeing people who were in a place that I know that I was in, not knowing or having that little bit of doubt. I want to be able to up, uplift others, erase doubt and then, and see them uh, recognize, you know, strengths they never knew they had. So that's me. Yeah. Cheers for that, brothers. I, I appreciate that. Um, right. Tita, answer your, like, you know, to add on to your thing, I think like, um, I don't personally, I don't think it's a selfish thing to make sure that you're happy first and foremost. Like, you can't take care of other people if you can't take care of yourself first, right? So, you know, like, number one, you got to look after. And as long as you're happy, you know, like, it it exerts out, uh, you know, and expresses, you know, outwards and happiness is uh, contagious. So, yeah, brother, keep doing it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Behind the Lava Lava. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with LB Robeck, founder of Discipline and Allegiance in New Zealand and advocate for mental health. If you were inspired by today's episode and want to learn more about LB's work, you can find him on social media at discipline underscore allegiance, or just look up discipline and allegiance. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow behind the lava lava. Make sure you leave us a review and thank you for joining us. We hope you found this interview informative and insightful. And don't forget to get them a tie watch. These are cool these are elegant stylish and <laughs> they represent the pacific island so thank you and until next time to fa soy fua <laughs>